so the next module, I noticed a little bit of flickering, like kind of up here on the rafters of the elevator. I'll, I'll play it again, just like focus kind of right over here. And you see the colors are flickering in and out just a little bit. Nothing too major. It might actually be hard to catch with YouTube compression. But regardless, like every single peak and trough on this line indicates that there's some kind of light flicker, some kind of difference in light. So again, the higher that this number is, and there's a keyframe, or this is frame zero, this is frame maybe 10, this is frame 121, which we keyframe, this is the last frame, the 400th frame. So every single point along this line is an image in the sequence. The higher the line is along that point, the more light there is in that image. The lower it is, the, the less light there is in that image, the less that exposure, the less exposed that shot was. So what Visual Deflicker allows us to do is it takes this purple line that we've just rendered and it allows us to conform. If we go all the way to zero, it conforms identical to what that line is. If we ramp it up all the way to 50, it makes it as straight as possible. But if you're shooting, especially doing outdoor or landscape, you never want it to be forced. You never want to force those values to be as straight as possible because then you're, you're losing detail in how the light naturally changes. So what we want to do is we want to avoid these little teeny peaks and troughs, but we want to maintain the actual natural exposure of the environment. So I almost never, I, I never put it up to 50. I'm usually hovering around 10-ish. In this case, because it's indoors, we really don't need it that much. We just keep in mind that this dip, while natural, it throws off the time lapse a little bit. And then these little peaks here, we, we may want to correct a little bit. So I'll actually just slide this over until it looks, you know, maybe like here. There's no, it's an art, not a science, right? So you kind of want to eyeball it and then we will click apply and it's uh, LR time lapse will go ahead and re-render the frames that is changing in the values here. These are all the Lightroom values that we're seeing. And I love that. It's like the Pavlov bells. Like every time I hear that bell, my mouth waters a little bit. <laughs> Let's see how this one came out. You see, and, and as you play through this, you notice that the light feels natural still, but we're seeing less of the little jitter flickers in the lighting. Um, and that's typical when you're indoors too. You can see like the flicker of fluorescent lights and all that. We've just finished this visual deflicker, the keyframes, but actually every single frame is now updated based on the visual deflicker that we've set. And that's because as we saw the purple line regenerate, it's actually rewriting all that information to every single XMP file as the sidecar files. So now all that information is already saved in these XMP files. So that means that I can just go right back into Lightroom, right? And Lightroom will actually tell me like this little upward arrow, it says metadata was changed externally, right? LR time-lapse changed this metadata externally. So that's a good thing, right? Because we're using LR time-lapse to be able to take these key frames, apply color, and then take that applied color, right? Control A in grid mode by hitting G for grid mode, control A to select all. And we'll go to metadata we'll go read metadata from files because the metadata is right there, right? So now we'll see all the color starts to change on all these frames according to the values that LR time-lapse assigned. So we're, we're done, right? We, we just created the color profile for every single, all 400 of these frames in LR time-lapse and Lightroom. And we've already seen the visual preview, so we trust that it, it's up to a quality standard that we, that we want. Right, so now I have my uh, profile, it's all finished up, my progress bar across the top, even though the visual previews in Lightroom still haven't finished loading, which they're about to, I could still highlight all and export. So I'll go ahead and do that, I'll hit Control A, click Export, so that I will go down to the LR time lapse export presets, right, and I'll just go ahead and find, I usually export to JPEG original. And I'll go ahead and click on, you know, set my save destination. I'll throw it in. I have a couple hard drives on this computer. So I'll put it in my LR time lapse exports folder. And then maybe I'll rename or create a folder, call it Atlanta. I have a couple, couple, you know, this is like 12.7. So I have 
13 different destinations for time lapses and each destination like in the interior of the Marriott Marquis I had four time lapses so I had like probably more than 15 maybe about 20 time lapses that I took in Atlanta quick promo I have an Atlanta video pending I have to render these time lapses first but it's coming out so I'll save this LR time lapse folder um, in Atlanta I'll select that folder as a save location. The name of the sequence is 12.7 TL Marriott Marquis because that's my naming convention. You can name it whatever else you want. These files should be about 6K resolution and you can choose to render it to 4K, to the original. You can choose how you want to render the files. I always render my time lapses to the maximum resolution that they natively come out of the camera just because I want that extra flexibility while I'm editing and post-process when I'm actually clipping together these videos. Depending on your needs, depending on your uses, I know a couple people that actually do, they have LR Timelapse Pro, I also have LR Timelapse Pro, but they'll render to TIFF in 16-bit. And that's if you want completely no loss of information, complete lossless file structure. It retains colors, but that's more often than not a very um, costly way to store your information. Storage, while it's cheap, storing a time lapse, like a 400 frame time lapse, we'll see how big this file is, but it adds up. They, they go into the gigabytes for how large these files are. So I'll go ahead and click on original JPEG 8 bit. My LR time lapse executable file, I don't really mess with. It's already mapped to where it is natively on my computer when you install it. And I'll go ahead and click export. Boom. Right, preparing, and now we just wait for these 400 frames to be exported. So, and all right, it looks like Lightroom just finished exporting all 400 frames, and I got a little ping on my LR time lapse window. And immediately, when those 400 frames, when the sequence finishes rendering, you get this pop-up window in LR time lapse, and it's it's basically telling you and asking you like what file size, what file type, what resolution, where to save it, all that kind of stuff. And it's pretty common that you know people go through and choose like MP4 or ProRes. They want 4K UHD. They'll put a frame rate of 24. I more often than not don't really mess with this pop-up window. You're more than welcome to. Um, when I when I render an LR time lapse specifically, when I render those the sequence to the final video output, sometimes I get glitches, and it's not an uncommon issue. Um, depending on the computer that you're using and the types of files that you're putting through it, and maybe like the JPEG, if you did JPEG or TIFF, and, and there are different factors that go into whether you see glitches or not. Um, even if I were to use this, there's maybe only like a 5% chance that I'd see a glitch. Sometimes they pop up, not all the time. I normally take my 400 frames or my full sequence and run it through Premiere and edit there. Uh, for this video, we're just going to cap it here. And we'll render to ProRes 422 at, um, let's do the source resolution, right, which is just, just slightly above what 6K is listed at here. I think it's 6,000 by 4,000 on this image sensor. I'm not going to force my output to 16 by 9. I'll edit that myself in post. I'm not going to apply LR time lapse motion blur. Not going to do sharpening. Not going to do any of that. Quality, I'll leave it high. Color sampling, I'll leave it 422. I'll, I'll leave all this stuff alone. I will leave the export location as well because this is in that folder that we set earlier. So I'll just click render video. And we see there's this little uh, progress bar down here at the bottom left of the screen while the video renders. That little uh, LR time lapse ding means we should go check. And here is our video in ProRes 422. It's a .mov file. We'll go ahead and just double click it. it. Should launch QuickTime Player on this Windows 10. And huge resolution. Let's hit the playback and let's check out the fruits of our labor. And there you have it. We just rendered that time lapse from start to finish using 
Lightroom and LR time lapse with this image sequence from Atlanta, Georgia at the Marriott Marquis. So if you like the tutorial, if you are enjoying the video, have enjoyed the video so far, feel free to drop a comment below, like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll be posting more tutorials in the future and I'll be posting more of my cinematic edits in the future too. I have a whole list of places that I've been and over the last several years shooting and I'm trying to get that content out because why would why wouldn't I want to get that content out? <laughs> so yeah, uh, thanks a lot, everybody, and we will we will be back soon.